Hey everybody, what's going on? Happy Grade School Friday, excited to be with you guys. Um, what's new? How is everyone? Uh, I, this is gonna feel like, like I, I feel like I end up like randomly plugging like, like foods and beverages and, and things that I'm into that uh, I, I feel like they should all, I should have like a marquee of like peanut butter and other various sponsors, but the one I'm gonna plug today is this stuff called Element that uh, one of the uh, team members here at CKC got me turned on to. This stuff is so good. It's like these, like it's like a like a salty electrolyte packet that you put in your water, and it makes water so much fun. Um, so go grab some Element. That's what I'm doing. Um, it's a good day today. We have a new co-host with us today, guys. I'm really excited to welcome Annie to the show. Welcome, Annie. Hello, everybody. Delighted to be here with you all. It's going to be a good sesh. Annie's been uh, in the mix with uh, the. The community and has taken uh, several of our courses now and uh, glad to have her with us and even though we we miss Ralph and Gadali and uh, we'll see them again very soon um, so we're talking about the new template node graph and a couple of other kind of assorted changes to uh, migrating workflow uh, here on the channel that uh, we highlighted in this week's video so questions on that and questions uh, beyond as time permits are all fair play to me um, I'm going to start by answering uh, a question that came in on the comments this week that I didn't get the chance to reply back to. So let's start there and then we can go to everybody's questions. Uh, let me see if I can get you all so that you're seeing my resolve. Okay, there we go. All right, so we had a question come in and let's just go ahead and reset to the baseline of our template node graph here. And I'm also going to double check my settings all around. Okay, cool. Yeah, so what I've got going on, just uh, context for everybody, I've just got a look going on from Voyager here. Crucis. That's one I haven't pulled out in a while, but it looks really nice. Um, so the question that came in was, what made you switch from uh, contrast pivot to lift gamma gain or lift and gain for your contrast ratio adjustments? That's something I kind of meant to talk about uh, in uh, this pre-recorded video this week, but there was a bunch of new stuff to share and I ended up not getting around to that. But I thought I'd speak to it because it's a really good question. Because as you guys know, in sort of like my prior iteration of my node graph, I would do something like this. I would have exposure and then ratio and exposure we would use like you know, offset or whatever we want to use. And then we would go over to our next node and work contrast ratio, which I would usually do with contrast pivot. And you might see the first clue as to why I've made that change already, because look at the reach that I've had to make with my left hand to get over to the contrast pivot over here. And you might say, well, why don't you just use your right hand? Well, it's because there's two knobs and I would have to do like that. So that's kind of reason number one is I've changed panels and contrast pivot is a little bit less convenient on this panel than it is uh, on the mini panel. Um, but the other bigger reason for me, if I go back to our uh, new template node graph here, is that with the, like the biggest change in this template node graph is this primary node that we have going on here. And the change is that we go from like rigorously and explicitly setting exposure in one node and then moving on and rigorously setting our contrast ratio in the next node. And because we're doing those things separately in that prior iteration, it makes sense to, at least at a baseline, sort of like constrain yourself so that you're not moving exposure with your contrast pivot. Does that make sense? So like you guys again know that if I were doing contrast pivot here, and since I'm in DaVinci Wide Gamut, if I set my pivot to 0.336 and I've set my exposure here, for example, and I'm doing my ratio here, or here rather, now if I set contrast, this is gonna be totally neutral. So like it's not going to uh, move my exposure up or down whatsoever. Um, so it's a good sort of way to keep exposure from moving uh, like when I'm making this adjustment. But since we're now working in this sort of prime node mode here, and my system is like acting funky. Hello nodes, wake up. Well, I'm, I, I don't need my hands for a second. I'll let Resolve catch its breath. but. Because we're now working in this prime node where exposure and contrast ratio are all kind of happening in one place, there's not really as much of an impetus to make sure that, oh, your contrast adjustments aren't moving exposure at all because exposure is right next door. So it becomes more of a fluid combination of lift, gamma, gain, and offset that I'm using with, uh, in my, my case, my four big wheels here on my panel. 
So that's kind of the reason for the change in the way I'm adjusting contrast ratio is I am able to operate a little bit more fluidly. It doesn't really, uh, I'm able to operate a little more ergonomically in terms of like the actual surface I'm using. And I don't really have the same priority that I did on locking to an explicit mid gray because I'm moving mid gray, I'm moving exposure around right inside of this node anyway. So I hope that uh, kind of makes sense. Oh, and the last thing that I'll just say uh, on that note is that the, uh, there's a third ingredient or a second ingredient, if you want to think of it that way, that gets introduced by doing lift gamma gain instead of contrast pivot. Now, instead of adjusting the top and the bottom, I can adjust the middle as well with my gamma. So there's a bit more flexibility, a bit more uh, sort of uh, ability to finesse and nuance things that you don't necessarily have with contrast pivot. So if anyone else was wondering that or uh, if the original commenter uh, with that question is here today, then uh, there's my, my spiel for you. Uh, and I'm now going to shut up and we can take some questions and I'll see if I can get my resolve to wake up for me. All right, first of all, I'm getting word that I'm a lot louder than you, Cullen. <laughs> oh, okay. We have the technology to fix that. One sec here. Okay, Annie should be a good bit quieter. You guys let us know if she's too quiet. All right, here we, here we go. How's that sounding? You have, you're speaking to the future. That's the weirdest part about this stream. <laughs> yes. All right. So we'll just start with a question while we figure that out. Um, oh, how do you deal with several different raw sources in a node-based color management? Like if you have Ari and Blackmagic raw in a single project? Oh yeah, good question. Let's uh, go through that together here. I'm just relaunching Resolve because it's acting funky on me. Yeah, so uh, the short answer there is, uh, as you guys might know, I rely heavily on the group function in Resolve when I'm doing node-based color management. So that's the, the fundamental way that I tackle that issue is we're just going to use IDTs for each of those raw sources and map into DaVinci Wide Gamut. And I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. And we can flip back over to my Resolve. That's super weird that Resolve just stopped talking to me. I must have I upset it. I offended Resolve. Sorry, Resolve. Gosh, so sensitive. Um, so we can actually see it like even here in this timeline right now. I've got what happens to be quite a bit of airy material, but you know, like we've got some red stuff in here as well and uh, some phantom stuff, which I'll, eh, we won't talk about phantom today, but there's fun stuff coming about phantom very soon. Uh, a better IDT solution for phantom. Has anyone ever tried to color manage phantom and been like, wait, this sucks and it looks terrible, what's going on? Solution coming soon, very excited. Um, but if, let's just use the example of airy versus red, okay? So I've got uh, a raw red clip here, and then I've got, uh, let's see if I have an actual airy raw. Yeah, so like shots five and 30, an airy raw and a red. This should be enough to kind of illustrate the difference. For airy raw, this belongs to a group called log C3. And in the, pre -group, uh, the group pre-clip uh, section of this node graph, I have my input transform that's taking me from Airy Wide Gamut 3 log C3 into my working space DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. Okay, And all I did there is I right clicked and I said, the first time I needed that group, I said add into a new group. I, I named that group and then I went to this section of the node graph to make the adjustment. Now let's look at the red shot. This one's actually perfect because I haven't uh, mapped it already. So this one, as you can see, it doesn't belong to a group, which I can tell because I don't have a little chain link icon down here. And I only have two dots up here at the uh, top of my node graph here. So what I need to do is right click this and add it into my red group, which I probably already have. Yeah. So since I already have this, I'm going to right click, go groups, red, assign to group. Okay. And now if I go in here and I look at my input transform, let's just make sure I'm doing that correctly, which I am. And so now you know, there's sort of like short, medium, and long answer to these things, but the short answer, the short sort of like working principle here is that my image is in the same basic metric. This image is in the same basic working metric as shot number five is, even though they originated in different metrics. Does that make sense? So from that point forward, I really don't need to think about camera anymore, and I can just think about image. And we've talked about that here on the channel before about like, a camera-centric versus an image-centric approach to grading. Very much an advocate for taking an image-centric approach where you are leveling out the differences between cameras, at least uh, to the best that uh, a color management framework like 
resolve color management can do. And then you're thinking more about the image than you are about the camera. So like to uh, just sort of like flesh out the point a little bit, by the time, you know, if I've had an assistant prep in this timeline for me and it's ready to be graded uh, to the setup that I like, which is what I've just shown you guys, I don't really care what this shot originated on. I might not even ask, I might not even know at any point in the process, because it doesn't really matter. I'm just in DaVinci Wide Gamut and I'm grading based on what I see here in the image. And weirdly, Resolve is locking up on me again? What are you doing to me? That's super weird. Thankfully, that part doesn't require illustration, but it sure would be nice if my image would wake up. Anyway, that'd be uh, my answer there. I hope that's helpful. What else we got? Uh, Jim and a few other people are asking about what benefit is there to feeding the bottom row without the exposure? Oh, good question. So I, I think the, if I could sort of like flesh that out a little bit for anyone who's uh, not already hip to it, I'm relaunching Resolve as we talk about this and seeing the horrifying image of myself on the reference monitor, super weird. Um, the question is like, if we're not making an explicit exposure adjustment in the top row of the template node graph, what benefit is there to the bottom row? I'll emphasize to you guys, like I think there are two primary benefits that are sort of like of equal weight to me of like having this sort of scheme in my um, uh, template node graph where I've got this top row that I use for primaries and this bottom row, which by the way, I might end up with more than one row for secondaries. It's twofold. The first one is just sort of like about real estate because I tend to be like, some of you guys who've been on the channel for long enough know that I was like a diehard serial node person. So this is what my node graphs would end up looking like. And Resolve does a decent job of kind of trying to vertically stack those and take advantage of the vertical real estate of the node graph. But because they're serial nodes, there tends to be a lot of left to right sort of space taken up as opposed to top to bottom. So what I find with the uh, parallel node structure is that I can literally just have more, take better advantage of the vertical real estate of a node graph. That's just kind of a geographical thing or a geometrical thing. Um, but the other reason for this kind of still holds, even with this template node graph, I don't want in the specific case of like qualifiers, which we've talked about before, I want to just be able to pull those down here without the, their, without the key changing based on my primaries decisions. And I know we've talked about this before, but it's been a while, so I'm gonna uh, just quickly sort of go back through it. So like the, the easy example here would be if I am, you know, like if I have my exposure and uh, you know, like in this case, contrast ratio adjustments because we're in my new template node graph here, if I've got those things kind of all set up, uh, let me turn this gallery off for you guys so you can see the image a little bit bigger anyway. Oh, and I think we may not be seeing the resolve screen at the moment. Oh, thank you. There we go, should be better now. Um, so if I've got this, this uh, image set up like this and I'm kind of grading through it, the first thing that I'm gonna do, like the, the first question I'm gonna ask whenever I get my first piece of feedback from a client, whether that's like, I've sent out the pass for review and there's notes coming in on Frame.io or we're live in the room. Whatever the case is, the first question I'm gonna ask is, can I solve that here? I'm always gonna try to solve stuff here rather than adding nodes or tweaking secondaries. It's not always possible to like, hey, the power window is too aggressive. That needs to be addressed in the node with the power window, but I'm always looking to make changes here. So the reason I emphasize that is because over the course of the project, the nodes which we'll see the most continuous change and revision are these three nodes because I'm trying to address nodes here because that's the easiest, simplest, cleanest place to uh, apply changes. So for that reason, if I'm doing things like pulling qualifiers, that's really the best example here, by having that qualifier pulled down here, I don't need to worry about the key changing when I make changes to my first three nodes up here. Does that make sense? It allows me to pull a key from a stable state of image that isn't dependent on nodes that are gonna to continue to change throughout the process. Uh, that's kind of the main benefit uh, for me of having, uh, in addition to just having more vertical real estate, it just allows me to do things down below that aren't gonna be subject to the continued changes uh, up above. Um, and again, like I guess the last thing I would note that kind of piggybacks more on the first point, got the vertical real estate aspect of it, but there's also just kind of a division of like, like I can visually look at 
this node graph and I know where the really important stuff is, I know where the next most important stuff is, and uh, what I was gonna mention here before is if I add an input to this, this is something I'll do like more on short form, I would say, than on uh, long form things, where I would just like add another input to the parallel node and I might have multiple uh, kind of like tracks like this. And these might be about like, oh, on this one I'm gonna do the product, on this one I'm gonna do the talent, on this one I'm gonna do something else. Like it might be cleanly divided like that, or it might just be a way of keeping things from turning again into like an endless row of serial adjustments. Um, but it helps me to kind of visually prioritize. Like, all right, here's like the heartbeat of the grade, here's like the secondary stuff, here's like the tertiary stuff, to use a, a fun word that I haven't needed to use in a while. Um, but that's kind of like the other uh, uh, aspect of just like setting up the node graph that way for sort of the sake of visual delineation and for optimizing the node graph space. I hope that answers the question. I know that's a recap, uh, a lot of that's a recap for uh, Jim, but uh, maybe for some newcomers to grade school or for those of you guys who haven't heard those things in a while, then there's some fresh thoughts in there. Okay, I think we maybe still have some audio issues, but maybe you could just repeat the questions that I'm asking. Okay, um, are you, are you, what, what's the, is there a I'm hearing consensus? that I'm choppy and possibly oh. loud as well. Oh, okay. Very choppy is what I'm hearing. Okay, people, got it. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, for now, I'll, I'll plan to repeat the questions and maybe okay. trim audio a little bit. So, in the past, you also mentioned you tend not to use scan since it's not loading metric. How does your view about that change now that you're using look again again over a contrast to fit? And what's like your relationship with the middle grade situation with the scan terms and that kind of thing? You guys are so cool. I, 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 I love that everyone. I love that anyone re like remembers me saying that and that we're getting to have this conversation because like I've had I've asked that question of myself and had that conversation with myself a lot so uh, I'm really excited to have it with someone else um, so yeah here's kind of my thinking there the question is in the past uh, you Cullen have talked a lot about keeping things more photometric and uh, constraining yourself at the primaries level to tools that have a photometric basis so like cleanest example of a tool with a photometric basis would actually be something that I haven't done at all yet today. Something that I would do more like in my old node stack of doing exposure with linear gain like this. This is like the most pure photometric adjustment that you can make. This is literally, uh, you know, like if I do this in powers of two, I'm just opening and shutting the, the lens uh, or I'm, you know, like opening and closing uh, the stop of the lens uh, in increments of stops. So that's like a great example of a pure photometric adjustment. You could say that qu quite close to that would be a contrast pivot adjustment. Remember I set my pivot to 0.336 a minute ago and that was my uh, mid-gray of Da Vinci wide gamut. That's another one that is very photometric in nature because I am adjusting eff effectively what's called the slope, just like the contrast of the image and pivoting around the mid-gray of the system. So I'm, it's, it's like quite equivalent to like you know, like increasing your contrast ratio on set in a linear fashion, right? So that's uh, quite photometric adjustment as well. What we're talking about now is like Cullen is saying, oh, well, now I'm using this prime node where I'm freely floating between offset, which is already not quite as photometric as linear gain, but I'm using that for my uh, exposure adjustment. And then I'm also using lift and gain. Those are close to contrast pivot, except that you can't constrain to mid gray using those, even though you're getting a linear adjustment on the top and bottom. But the biggest part of it is Cullen has added in gamma, which is of all the things that we just talked about, that has the least photometric analog. Like that's just a signal processing thing. There's really not an analog for that that I can think of in terms of physical light. Like gamma, there's no way to recreate the behavior of a gamma wheel out in the real world one-to-one, -one, anywhere near one-to-one. -one. So the question is like, all right, so have you moved your thinking on the importance of keeping things photometric in your grade? And I would say yes and no. Um, I have in the sense that like, I've always known that there's a point in the grade, like let's, let's go to the tail of the node graph here for a second. Let's look at this look. And let's go to some other image. Okay, so if I turn this look off and on, you guys know how much I love looks. You guys know how big look development, uh, play, or, or big a role look development plays in my color grading practice. And you can see like, this is defining 
the image right here, like as much, maybe more so than anything I'm gonna do over here at my clip level, okay? So, but if we think about this, there is nothing photometric happening in this look at all. It's all about the image and about the display and we're really downstream of thinking of anything that we would think of in a photometric term and we're just in a display referred term. So that's a way of saying that like, I've always had this notion in my mind that as I move through my grade, I'm going to start photometric and then slowly work my way away from photometric and just I'm gonna be more concerned with the rendering of the image than I am with the uh, photometrics of the image, if that makes sense. It's a slippery kind of abstract concept, but it's an idea I've had in my mind for a long time. Like as you're moving through a signal, uh, an imaging pipeline, you're gonna move further and further away from photometric adjustments because the most photometric things you're gonna do are the things that you actually do in camera, right? So even like this first step of like doing, even if I was doing linear gain, that's less photometric than opening or shutting a lens just because it's not a physical process, it's an electronic process, even though it models a physical process very well. So I've already moved a little bit away from that and by the time I get over here to my look and my display transform, this has nothing to do with photometrics really, it has everything to do with just shaping the way the image is rendered, okay? So in that sense, that's always something I've had in my mind, but the difference here is that I'm getting more into that space earlier in the process. So my whole idea here is like, all right, if I wanna be more tethered to like, just the way that the image, uh, like altering the signal as it was captured or altering like the physics of the image, I can still do and think about that in a pretty principled way simply by not reaching for gamma if I don't want to and just hitting exposure and like contrast ratio and then going over to my balance node which uh, is still in linear gain mode by the way, gamma linear and then I would do typically do gain here and I can do that. This is again a very photometric adjustment because it's uh, effectively changing the relative response of the red, green and blue photosites on the camera sensor or the cyan, magenta and yellow layers uh, on a film negative if we we're talking about film. So that's very photometric as well. So I could still keep it photometric all through my primaries adjustments if I wanted to. I just like having the option of reaching for gamma and the short answer that I've been rambling toward this whole time would be that I like having the lever. I like having the knob at my in my hands and built into my process that I can reach for of something like gamma right from the start of the process because it depends on the image that you're looking at. Like if you have an image that's like two stops over and really orange or whatever, I'm thinking about photometrics because we gotta get this thing pulled in and we gotta get the color kind of balanced out, right? But if we have an image like this one, you know, like that's where it started. By the time I, you know, like let's just reset things here for a second. By the time I get this balanced, there's not that much that needs to really change here. Let me make sure this is still in. There we go, I didn't think so. I'm putting that gamma back to linear. Like by the time we get this thing balanced out, it's a really nice looking image, it's well exposed. Like I don't need to like work the photometrics as much as I need to start shaping the rendering of the image, which is what's gonna cause me to, not even in this case touch offset, but probably look at like bringing up blacks and bringing down gamma and bringing up gain and just kind of shaping the rendering of the image off, on. And that's not even a big change, but you kind of see what I'm saying. Like for a well shot image, there's not as much for me to do photometrically and more for me to do uh, just preferentially, creatively. And I want to feel like I can dive right into that as soon as I want to. If I want to do it in node one, node one is set up to allow me to do that. Kind of a long talk, but like that's a, a pretty profound question that like I've asked myself uh, a lot. So I'm glad it came up here. Uh, we're getting some questions about the switch to Gamma 2.2 for what you're doing for web and some curiosity about elaborating on that for online viewing and kind of talking about Rex 109 versus sRGB for output and stuff and also for calibrating your monitor. Like are you working on your 2.4 monitor but outputting 2.2 or is it staying to 2.2 in your live stream model? Okay, okay. First I'm gonna uh, remember to repeat the question. So we've got Sounds like a number of questions that uh, are fundamentally starting with uh, wanting to understand my choice of setting my output transform going forward to gamma 2.2 instead of gamma 2.4 and wanting to get a little bit more detail on what else is changing there. Like, am I changing my monitor? Where does sRGB play into this? Why is this better for YouTube? So there's uh, sort of a, a constellation of questions that we're gonna try to address in the next minute or two here. 
Again, uh, you guys will forgive me for being even a little more long-winded than usual because these are like big concepts that have like multiple dimensions. So I'll try to make tidy work of talking about this, but it might take a minute. So the, the TLDR, the fundamental thing that is like easiest to take away from this conversation about why the change to gamma 2.2? Why are you outputting to gamma 2.2 instead of gamma 2.4? Forget about my reference monitor for a second. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's just imagine that the only thing I'm doing is grading on like my GUI display and the only place I'm ever gonna see this or anyone's ever gonna see this or the main place that it's ever gonna be viewed is like on a laptop or an iPad or a phone of some sort. In general, Gamma 2.2 is a much closer match to what all of those devices that I just rattled off those are gonna have much closer to a gamma 2.2 than a gamma 2.4 response. Are they all dead on gamma 2.2? I can't swear to that at all. That we're talking about all kinds of different devices. But in general, they're going to have a native response of gamma 2.2-ish, much more so than they are of gamma 2.4. So if that's all we have to worry about, and in the case of like, when I master YouTube videos for you guys, that is all I have to worry about. I'm never gonna, you know, like my YouTube videos are never gonna be broadcast on a streaming service. They're all gonna be on YouTube, right? So for my purposes, it's ideal. And if that's what your destination is for your content, same logic applies, Gamma 2.2 is going to be better, okay? So that's what, what covers the sort of like encoding side of things. Now let's bite off like the reference monitor side of things and like whether there's a mismatch or a matched encoding there. All I'm doing on my reference monitor, like before we started this session this morning, before I create YouTube videos for you guys, I simply change the gamma response of my reference monitor from 2.4 to 2.2. So I'm seeing like, you'll have to take my word for it because you aren't standing here looking at what I'm looking at, but with my image here in my GUI versus my image on my right on my reference monitor, they're really close because uh, I've got gamma 2.2 here and gamma 2.2 here, and I'm also using my Mac OS viewing transform to tighten things up here on the GUI even a little bit more. Um, so that's kind of like the big pieces there. We're targeting gamma 2.2 and we're not gaming anything. There's no mismatched encode decode thing happening. Like I'm targeting gamma 2.2 here. I'm expecting gamma 2.2 on my reference monitor. Or if I'm not using a reference monitor, I'm uh, trusting that I'm close to gamma 2.2 on my GUI monitor that I might be using kind of like for a general idea of what I'm grading. So that's the idea there. Uh, and the last thing I wanna to touch on is sRGB. I feel like sRGB, we need like a name for this list of stuff that I just wish didn't exist and was like outlawed completely. All, short, short list right now, video levels. Let's just get rid of video levels. This, that's a tangent that we can talk about uh, later on if you guys want to. But let's just, no one ever use video levels ever again. It, there's no purpose for it. It's a completely outdated, archaic notion of like remapping zero black and one white to higher than zero and lower than one. And there's no reason for it whatsoever. It serves no benefit in 2024, but there's all this residue from uh, a time in broadcast standards where it was serving a purpose. Let's just get rid of that. Let's strike it from the record. But the reason I thought of that is because the other thing that is right in that same category for me, sRGB. sRGB should just be stricken from the face of the earth as a standard or a word that we ever utter ever. Because sRGB is a ubiquitous thing that can actually mean one of two things. It can mean, a, it, it can mean an encode that is slightly different than gamma 2.2. I mean, that's the one thing that it always means. So like, let's just, kind of make a picture out of this because I've been yakking for a while here. Let's just look at a grayscale ramp. And let's look at the difference. I'm gonna make this as visual as possible. We're just gonna do a CST and we're gonna keep things really simple. And I'm just gonna say Rec 709 linear to Rec 709 gamma 2.2. We're gonna turn everything else off, okay? So check out the waveform here and let's save a still of this. We're gonna call this gamma 2.2, if I remember how to type. Okay, now watch what happens if I encode to sRGB. There's just a little tiny nudge in there. Now, it's a little bit bigger than it, it like it can be a little bit more pronounced visually than it might seem here on the ramp, but like fundamentally, 
that's the difference. Like, that's an sRGB encoding, that's a gamma 2.2 encoding. It's just a little change of like the behavior down in the toe, the way the image is encoded, okay? So if that's all that sRGB meant, and sRGB had the same property that any other like gamma encoding does, that's like, yeah, you encode gamma 2.2 and then you decode gamma 2.2 on your monitor, then I wouldn't have any beef with sRGB even though it's not really necessary. I would just say, okay, it's another standard. If you wanna use it, then it doesn't matter. But the challenge is that there's no agreed procedure for what to do with a gamma, with a, an sRGB encoded signal. Some standards, some monitors, some, uh, you know, like uh, processes are going to decode sRGB as if it was gamma 2.2. And like some people will swear to you that is what sRGB is supposed to be decoded as. It's supposed to be encoded one way, but decoded slightly differently. There's supposed to be an asymmetrical encode decode. Others will say that's not right. You are supposed to one to one invert the sRGB so that you're getting back to a net linear, okay? That's my beef with sRGB is that there's no consensus, there's no like locked in standard of what exactly it means in terms of the encode and the subsequent decode, which is the case with any other gamma or like, you know, display encoding that we could think of. So that's kind of my beef there. Um, and so it's not gonna surprise you to hear that I'm not thinking about or using sRGB in my workflow at all. Although it's like worth noting, do you wanna know how I get gamma 2.2 on my reference monitor here? on this particular LG uh, OLED uh, reference monitor that I have, it calls its gamma 2.2 mode sRGB. How do I know that it's not decoding this, but it's decoding that? Because I've measured it. But if I hadn't measured it, I would have no way of knowing what this monitor means when it says sRGB. Does that make sense? So the easiest thing to do is just to avoid it completely and say gamma 2.2. Because the ultimate truth is like, I'll, I'll round this out with like one final thought experiment for you guys to think through. This is like, sounds simple, but it's actually kind of like difficult to wrap your head around, or it can be, it can be difficult to wrap your head around. Okay, let's say I have, let's say I have another reference monitor to the right of this one, okay? And I'm able to send two different preparations of my signal, one to each of these monitors, okay? If this monitor is set to gamma 2.2 and I send it this, I will get this, right? If this imaginary monitor over here is set to gamma 2.4 and I can simultaneously send a different output transformed image to that monitor and I set the gamma to 2.4, what will the difference be between the two images that I see here versus there? You guys are in future world, so I, I won't be able to pause to hear you answer the question, but I'm sure some of us will get it. What will the difference be between sending a gamma 2.2 CST image to a gamma 2.2 monitor versus a gamma 2.4 CST image to a 2.4 monitor. Zero, nothing, right? That's the whole point of encoding and decoding. We're supposed to like cancel one another out, right? That's the part that I always feel like gets lost in the conversation is like, we're, they're not supposed to be any different at all. The only time they're different is if you have a mismatch between the encode and the decode. So. That's kind of a long conversation, but that's the, the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to sRGB. sRGB makes it really, really difficult to know confidently that you have a symmetrical encode decode that are canceling each other out and netting you out a linear reproduction of your original image, which is the whole point of motion imaging. We want it to look to our eyes on the monitor like it did to our eyes if we'd been standing there on the set, roughly speaking, prior to any creative manipulation, right? So that's kind of the sRGB side of it. I would just not think about sRGB, not use it uh, whatsoever, and stick with gamma 2.2. Boy, I talked for a minute, but I hope that helps flesh out the thinking on that stuff. Okay, question here. Um, so in this week's video, you talk about combining functions, exposure and pivot into one node. When would you decide to combine functions to make processing easier versus keeping functions separate for organization? You know, it's a really good question, the, and uh, I'll, to, to repeat it, the question is, you know, like, with all this conversation about combining functions like you are in the primary node versus the idea of keeping things very, like, separated out, how do you decide whether to keep things separate or whether to combine them? Ultimately, I think that's a, like, personal 
question that has to come down to your process. I'll give you a quick summary of mine just because I think it'll be helpful. If you were to rewind to my color grading process, I don't know, like six years ago, you would have seen in all of my template node graphs, you would have seen exactly what we're talking about this week and what I have now. You would have seen this primary, this prime node, and its contents would have actually been pretty similar to what I'm doing now. The main difference would be that there wasn't much offset in there because I really didn't understand offset or its purpose. And I just felt like, ugh, it just like makes it really easy to like clip stuff out, so I'm gonna avoid it. Uh, not a very scientific take, but that was my take at the time. So that's where I was with like combining a bunch of stuff and basically saying like, I've got one node that does all of my primary tonal adjustments. That's really what this primary node is all about, right? As you guys know, I moved off of that for a long time and I was doing my exposure and my contrast ratio in separate nodes, separating out those functions, having one node for each of those functions. And it was really, really helpful for me to get a more sort of delineated sense of, okay, I'm doing this and then I'm doing that and they are separate things. They are not the same thing. Exposure and ratio are highly interconnected and they interact a lot, but they are not the same thing. They are different things. I learned that and developed an intuitive connection to that idea by having my template node graph set up in that way for many years. So I'm really glad that I took that detour. And at a certain point I realized uh, like in the last year or so, I'm like, I actually don't need that delineation in separate nodes to keep that concept firmly in mind or to keep my workflow simple and uh, like manageable for myself, like to keep the processes simple. I found it a little bit less overwhelming maybe to be like, okay, all you do here is exposure. All you do here is contrast pivot. I realized, wow, I actually don't feel like I need that anymore. I've got the, I'm, I'm very connected to that idea. I actually feel more like I would like to have more stuff going on in one single node where I can just intuitively navigate the uh, tools within that node. So that's why I circled back around to doing everything in a single node. So I think it all depends on where you are in your journey and the concepts that you're trying to internalize and develop, developing a process for yourself that feels intuitive and efficient and fun. Um, so for me, that puts me back in wanting to have just the single node where I can freely move in between my adjustments. And I mentioned this in this week's video, like maybe one of my favorite things about this way of working is I'm barely thinking about my, what knob I'm touching at all. I'm like, I'm taking a very naive, like almost like beginner's type of approach that says like, you know, if you were to sit down a brand new person at a control surface and say, hey, make that look cool using these four things. They could actually do it if they had some visual acumen, couldn't they? That's sort of like where I'm feeling more like I'm at at the moment of my practice of like, hey, just like play. Just make that look cool using these. Any way that you can make this look cool using these is correct. Does that make sense? But that's like very contextual for me and my journey. So uh, it's the, it, it all depends on where you're at and what you're comfortable combining. I would say anytime you're feeling overwhelmed or like you're not getting your best results with a system, a great thing to do is to break it apart. Say, so, okay, you know what? Let's try simplifying this and like sort of separating it out in terms of concepts or units. One thing here, one thing there, one thing there. And then you can combine those things back together when you feel like you're ready to. Hope that helps. All right, let's see. Um, so someone's asking, I see some people doing balance first and then exposure slash primaries next as it would be photometric. What are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, good question. So uh, the, the question is about like whether it's better to do balance or exposure first, which of those things matters. This is another area where you guys are like, you, you know what a stickler I am for like optimizing and for choosing the best way of doing things and not just saying, oh, well, lots of different ways work. So I will pick any old way that works and maybe I'll change it up every third project, who cares? I try to be like very intentional uh, about optimizing and choosing the best process for uh, getting the best end result the most consistently. But that's a question, balance first or exposure first. My honest take, it doesn't matter whatsoever. Like, why would it matter? You're not clipping anything out. Nothing's going away. It's not like the, you know, like in, in this image or even a, a more extreme uh, version of this image, if we could envision like, you know, the balance being even further out than it is right now. Like, 
whether I do this balance in th my first node, like put it over here, and then do my exposure or vice versa, it doesn't matter. Like it's, you're gonna, you're gonna get to the same result if you're letting your eye guide you. There's no like signal advantage. There's no like processing advantage to doing one over the other. So the question naturally comes like, okay, then how do you decide which one to do better? The way I've got it decided, you guys have heard me talk about this I think here on grade school before. My default order for things in the node graph, unless there's a reason to do things differently, I want things to run left to right from stuff that's most visually important to me as the viewer. Exposure is more important than color balance. You guys have heard me say that before, right? Exposure is more important than color balance. Contrast ratio, more important than color balance. It's not the color balance is unimportant. Color balance is like a very close third to those things, but our eye is more sensitive to changes in luminance and contrast than it is to changes in color. You can get a great grade when you nail your primary adjustments and you're not quite dead on with your balance. The opposite is not true. If your primary adjustment is off, the image is always gonna feel off. So that's my logic of saying, of why I say like, all right, let's just do, let's hit the tonality, let's hit the tones, let's hit the luminance and the contrast pieces first, and then I will move forward and adjust my balance. And by the way, like you can still, because the actual processing order doesn't matter, if you land on a shot and you want to like go off book and be like, we're actually going to start over here because I'm just really bothered by that balance, that's okay. I'm not going to come and arrest you. No one else is either. Um, but in terms of processing order, in my opinion, zero difference between doing balance first versus a primary adjustment first. And I would argue like that would be a pretty bad color corrector if you couldn't get good results going either direction. That would be a pretty brittle signal processing chain that uh, I would ask more of uh, if that were the case. I hope that helps. Okay, to circle back to the raw question, what do you do when you are trying to bear the raw in the project setting, in the camera raw section, but you have more than one type of raw footage? Oh, good question. Yeah, so let's talk about how we debayer raw footage, specifically when we're working in uh, nodes, because uh, when we're working in nodes, as you guys, uh, many of you guys know, when we're working in nodes, this matters. Like if I go in here to my camera raw and I go to red and I change something here and I say, oh, decode to 1886, watch what happens to this image. Totally changes, right? That's different than when we're color managing in our project settings. When we're color managing in our project settings, I could set this to most, the most zany thing in the world in the project, the image is not gonna change whatsoever because when we're color managing in project settings, Resolve is smart enough to say, hey, it's raw, it needs to get into your operating space. I got that part, don't worry about it, I'm gonna take care of it, and it doesn't actually ask for you to help and it won't let you help. But when we're color managing a node, it's a different story. So the question is, how do we decide what to debayer to? I'll give you my logic. A lot of the time, the answer is fairly obvious. Like for red, I'm going with the manufacturer's recommendation. Their sort of stock operational, like big, large scene working color space is red wide gamut RGB log 3G10. I would have to like go back into like a legacy setup to do anything different if I wanted to go to like, you know, I, back in the day I used to do like Dragon Color 2 and red log film. Not because like I thought it was cooler, but because that's what the manufacturer recommended. So the short answer is just to go with what the manufacturer recommends and then you can find your way out of that with your color management. Now there are some other cases like Red, it's easy. Airy, it's easy. Airy, you actually get no option whatsoever, right? Unless you wanna, I think you could decode as, I guess you could decode it as log C4, which I don't see a reason to do. I haven't had that, had, had an uh, occasion pop up where I'm like, oh, that's getting me more latitude than I would have had otherwise, but maybe that's a thing. Um, but there's a couple of other formats. Uh, the main one that I've got in mind here is Blackmagic Raw. I mean, Sony RAW, that's one that, yeah, it looks like you can decode into these different spaces. So like Sony RAW and Blackmagic RAW, these are ones where they're like, hey, we'll go into ACES for you. We'll go into, you know, like, uh, you know, like ACES is the main one for Sony or like with Blackmagic, they'll even, because they make Resolve, they'll be like, oh, we'll go into DaVinci Wide Gamut for you. That's totally fine if you, you can, like, any option that's available to decode into that works for you here, like you should feel free to use. 
I typically, just as a matter of sort of like uh, convention and keeping things simple, I like to decode into whatever the manufacturer recommends as the like capture space. Like if I were, if, if I were shooting this not in RAW, what would Black Magic tell me I should use as my color space encoding? They would tell me to use um, Black Magic Design and Black Magic Design Film. So that's what I'm going to decode into here. And then I'll just let my input transform handle getting me into DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. Same thing with Sony. If I were to ask Sony, what should I capture to? They wouldn't tell me Ace is linear because I can't capture to Ace is linear if I'm not using a raw format or I can't even in that case do it. It's just raw, not debayered yet. If I was like, hey, I can't shoot raw. I need to capture like to a QuickTime format. What should I use? They would tell me S Gamut 3 or S Gamut 3 Cine with a gamma of S log 3. So that's what I'm going to decode into. That's not the only correct answer to the question. Like there's different ways that you could go about that, but that one feels like the most simple and like allows me, it's just a good shorthand for uh, making this process uh, as automatic as possible without having to think about it too much. Um, so that's how I debayer, and then I'll simply do the input transform based on that camera encoding format that I chose here and uh, encode or rather input transform uh, with this as the input. And let me just mention, uh, even though I don't have any Blackmagic footage here on the timeline, I'll just mention the process for this, Blackmagic Design as the color space, Blackmagic Design Film. This is the one example I can think of, at least off the top of my head, where what this says here actually doesn't match what I need to see in my uh, color space transform. So let's say that this shot was Blackmagic and not red. Here is what that source color space would look like. I would need to use black magic design uh, wide gamut gen 4 5 and then black magic design film gen 5. That is the equivalent of black magic design and black magic design film. It's kind of a weird mismatch and I always have to check myself on that but that's actually what you would need to do in order to get this working. Oh and then I would typically do color science gen 5 here as well. That's specific to black magic. The rest of these are all pretty easy, especially if you observe that convention of like, oh, I'm just gonna decode into whatever camera log metric that the manufacturer would tell me to if I hadn't been shooting raw in the first place. Okay, um, if the contrast in the HDR tool is not pushing the saturation, why would you choose um, to do, to push the contrast and remove it in the next node versus just using the HDR tool? Ooh, good question. If the contrast in the HDR tool is, you know, effectively adding contrast without affecting saturation, then why are you messing around with tools that do add con that, that do mess with that do introduce saturation or extract saturation when you're doing the contrast? Short answer there, because I don't like the HDR what the HDR zones tool does. Like you're right, it does a pretty good job of preserving saturation. I just don't like what it does. Like it feels really weird to me. I don't, and I guess we could graph, and I, I'm sure I've done this at some point, but it's been a minute. Let's just look at a ramp on this. I'm gonna turn everything off except for the ramp, the HDR adjustment, and flip over to our waveform. Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's doing a toe thing in the bottom and it's doing like a, you know, like a, a linear thing on the top. I just don't like it. Like, I, 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 I know that's not a very scientific answer, but that's my reasoning. I just don't like what it does. Um, so for that reason, like, it, it, I would rather get this shape, if that's the shape that I want. I'd rather get it with my uh, lift gamut and gain. And by the way, like, my move typically would not be to go like, oh, I have made a whatever, like I've made a contrast adjustment. Oh, God, I'm still in the HDR palette. Get me out of here. Would, it would not be to be like, oh, I've made an HDR adjustment and I am feeling or seeing my saturation go up, so now I'm gonna go downstream and trim my saturation. It wouldn't be that approach so much as something, uh, you know, a couple different ways that I could do it, but one of them is something we talked about in this week's video, just flipping over into this luminosity mode and saying, just hold saturation where it started. So something like that. Uh, and I will leak to you guys Actually, it's a good thing to uh, ask of uh, uh, ask you guys about as well. I am 
as you all know, I, I like do a lot of DCTL development and playing around with like custom tools and stuff. And I'll, without being coy, I'll put it to you this way. The new template node graph that we're working in here is the very closest analog to what I'm actually doing in my color grading practice, which does rely on some uh, private DCTLs that I haven't like made available or uh, decided to do anything with other than used for my personal grading practice. So it's a pretty good analog with what we do right here, but there are some additional things within that tool that allow me to, you know, like the, the there's a there's a slider, I'll put it this way. If I have this adjustment, you know, and then I create a layer mixer with it, and we set this composite mode to luminosity, like so, I have a knob in the DCTL that I'm referring to for my primary adjustment that allows me to feather in between no color preservation and full color preservation. Let's see, I'm not doing that right somehow. Um, well, I don't even need to illustrate it here, but I've got a knob that allows me to go in between this and that on like a sliding basis. So that's like the other, th there's a couple of things like that that uh, make it easier for me to say no to the HDR palette. But what I was gonna mention is, uh, I was gonna ask you guys is whether you'd be interested in grading tools like that after everyone gets a chance to kind of like either get familiar with this new node graph or you've got a practice that's working really well for you. I'm curious how many out there are like, I want the vanilla tools, they work really well for me in Resolve, they're simple, or would you be interested in more custom tailored uh, solutions for doing things like your primary node uh, adjustment in the form of like a DCTL or something? Let me know. Like I said, I've got zero plans. I don't have any angle when I ask you that question, but I am curious to know uh, what everyone uh, would think about that or whether you'd be interested in that because you know, maybe there's, a, maybe there's uh, something that we can do in that space. But long answer to the question, uh, but to sort of round it out, I, I just don't like what the HDR Zones palette does. I don't, you know, like the contrast pivot along with the exposure, they're probably the least offensive things in there, but uh, none of the adjustments within this tool set are particularly useful to me. And for me, it's easier just to say like, I'm gonna get the things done that I wanna get done without ever venturing into that tool set. What else we got? Um, a question from Luis. Do you ever pull in nodes after the parallel on your tree? And if so, could you give an example? I do put nodes after the parallel on my tree quite often. Uh, generally, we've talked about this, uh, but it's been a minute. I will put nodes for one example after the parallel stack here. Anytime I want to do an, a spatial a, 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 an interpixel adjustment is maybe the best way to put that. So when I say spatial adjustment, I don't mean a power window. A power window is a geometrical adjustment in the sense that I'm like, you know, adjusting my, where is my window outline? There we go. You know, like a power window, that's fine to do in my secondaries branch. That's an example of something that I would do in my secondaries branch all the time. But think about something like midtone detail or noise reduction. Something where I'm actually blurring pixels, like changing where, where, the, where the behavior of what I'm doing, it's not changing everything on a per pixel basis, it's changing things based on the pixels around each pixel. That would be, again, spatial things like midtone detail, texture pop, noise reduction, blur. Um, trying to think of anything else on that list. Those would be the main ones that occur to me. Anytime I'm doing any of those things, I'm 100% gonna get out from underneath this stack because you can get weirdness when you're working in here. I think I did this exact example in a video, but uh, just to do another one here. Oh, highlights and shadows in your primaries, that's another one. Those are inter-pixel adjustments. It's not just looking at, hey, do this to the current pixel. It's looking at do one of several things to the current pixel based on all the pixels around that pixel. They're more complex operations. Any operation like that, if you look at like what I'm getting out of my image here, I forget how I actually set up this experiment. 
uh, before, but let's do this. I don't want to do that here. But like, you're basically going to get odd, a, a different rendering of the image by doing something like midtone detail here versus over here. Yeah, I forget how I, how I exactly crafted this. I mean, you can see a slight kind of forensic difference in her lips here. Um, but the, go, go check out that video on, I think it's, it's called like I Made a Mistake or something like that um, to see the, the, a, a more thought out uh, demonstration of what I'm talking about. But you can take my word for it here today. Any spatial adjustment, so again, mid-tone detail, uh, noise reduction, um, blur, uh, primary highlights uh, or shadows, any of those things that are, are relying on interpixel adjustment, I'm gonna do downstream because otherwise you can get weird behavior. For me, practically, that's most often noise reduction. Like I don't typically do mid-tone detail. I'd never do primary shadows or highlights. Um, I don't typically do blur, but I do noise reduction as little as I can, but still quite often. And that's always, always, always gonna happen after this stack so that I don't get a weird interaction between the blurred or uh, smoothed versus the non-smoothed or non-blurred pixels. So that would be one example. Other than that, where it's like, oh, just I'm doing that because I have to do it that way. There's not many examples where I would do it. Um, maybe another one that I would do is like, if I just feel like, like I'll often do what I call like a trim node. You know, if I want, like this shot's actually a pretty exa good example. I'm like, the image is done. I'm happy, we're good, ship it. You know, like we're, but we're right at the end and I'm like, I just feel like these practicals are a little spicy. What I would do in a case like that is look at like, you know, pinning a control point in my custom curves, pinning two control points actually, so that I am uh, locking things above mid gray. Uh, let's just reset this. I don't know why those curves are defaulting like that. So yeah, I'm just gonna grab a a point where I want things to lock and then do another control point so that they really do lock. Kind of dopey, but that's the custom curves tool. And doing something like this, just to bring in those peak highlights, like that's something that, it's not that I, that it's like a terrible idea to do in the parallel stack, but if it's happening at the very end, if it's a little trim adjustment, sometimes I'll do stuff like that at the very end just because I'm like, hey, I don't, I, I want this to be tacked on to the very end final combined image here and just make a little final adjustment to the image. That would be another, the only other example that kind of comes to mind. Um, okay, gang, we got time for one more. Okay, um, when, when you're writing for the web, are you using the lighting kind of that we're seeing here or do you have a different lighting set while you're grading? Uh, when I'm grading for web, I mean, the, the lighting setup Spoiler alert, there are lights on in this room so that you guys can see me. And if they weren't on, then you wouldn't be able to see me very well. Um, let me grab this thing. When I'm grading for web, like, you know, I, I, I don't have, I've got like, you know, lights on, like, as I said, where you guys can see me. The, this whole room is on dimmers. So if I'm grading for like, you know, th theatrical or broadcast or something, I'm gonna have the room really, really dim. Um, if I'm grading for web, I will bump up the surround a little bit. Uh, just because I, that's going to be more in alignment with like the surround that people are going to be viewing that content in, and it does change things a little bit. But I'm going to give you guys another parting, uh, completely like uh, counter conventional idea here. There's a lot of conversation about s display surround and about needing to compensate for display surround with our grading decisions. I actually don't know how much water that holds for me, like. We talked about gamma encoding and uh, decoding and sometimes mismatching those, like a classic example of a mismatched encode decode. There's a very dominant school of thought in image mastering that says, okay, Cullen is mastering gamma 2.4 in his room and he's not doing a YouTube video, so the lights are all off, the surround is very dim, and he's mastering gamma 2.4. That gamma 2.4 now needs to deliver to gamma 2.2 devices that are going to be viewed in a very bright surround. There's a whole school of thought that says a pretty good solution to that is just to ship the gamma 2.4 because it's gonna render a bit brighter 
on the Gamma 2.2 display, which is decoding it improperly, but that's gonna be perfect because the surround, the ambient surround lighting is going to go up as well. I've never once been satisfied with that. I've tried that a gazillion times. Yes, it is a little bit brighter when the 2.4 is reproduced on a 2.2, but it's also lower in contrast. It also changes the saturation. It also changes the hues even a little bit. It's a completely like, sort of like improvised, uh, like uh, made up solution that I really have never been happy with. And I don't think it's necessary because like any display that I can think of today has a brightness control. Do you know anybody who doesn't know about their brightness control on their phone or their iPad or their laptop? I don't. So like my argument is often like, yeah, like if we're grading for web, I'll increase the ambient light in the room a little bit just because that's more aligned with what people are gonna be seeing. But I also trust like if I didn't do that, if we're grading it to, you know, whatever, my hundred-ish nit mastering level here in the room and someone looks at that on their web device and it looks kind of dim, they don't need me to have mismatched the gamma encode. They're just gonna reach for their brightness and turn it up. It's gonna be brighter than what we looked at here in the room and it's gonna do a better job competing with the surround. I don't know why that's not a more common basic piece of logic, but that's my logic with like competing with ambient surround and with mismatched surround between grading environment and display or you know like out in the real world environment. People are gonna turn their brightness knob up. I keep my ambient like uh, mastering levels to a general recommendation of like, it's actually around 110, 115 nits here in my room. And that's nowhere near like, even like an iPad is gonna get you well over 200 at max brightness. So people can always click their brightness up and for my money, like having done it both ways, that's a much better way of competing with ambient light than a colorist who mismatched the gamma encode because now it just feels flat and weird and bright in the wrong ways, if that makes sense. If anyone wants to educate me on why I'm dead wrong about that and why I should be thinking about uh, things along conventional lines, then I'm open to it. But that would be my take for you guys, and I would love to be proven wrong because so far no one's been able to do it. Um, okay, guys, that was a good sesh. Thank you for bringing your awesome questions and ideas and uh, for hanging out with me on Great School Friday. Thanks to my buddy Annie for being our special guest co-host with the most today. And um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, great weekend, and... I'll see you next week here on the channel, hopefully for one more grade school before many of you guys know it. We've got a, we've got a, a new member of the Kelly family on their way who is uh, going to arrive any day now. So hopefully we get one more grade school in before that happens. But if not, uh, I will see you guys very soon regardless. Take care, guys.